morning, everyone. Um, my name is Lori Hartwell, and uh, I am the president and founder of Renal Support Network. Today, we're going to be um, having a wonderful day to help address the youth and parents of people who have kidney disease. And I wanted to just specify, we are recording this, and uh, I'm, I'm really excited because we were, we were listening early on, and this discussion is so important. Uh, I had kidney disease back in 1968 and have lived with this illness for over five decades. So it's possible. Uh, you just need to do a little bit more work. And um, one of the things that I'm really excited about the next session is um, one of my key mottos is one friend makes a difference. And one friend makes a difference is the embodiment of Renal Support Network. Uh, when you're diagnosed with an illness, you often feel alone, you feel isolated, and when you're a child, it can magnify that. I'm very excited. I'm going to bring up Charlene here. Uh, Charlene, um, Charlene is an RSN board member, and I met Charlene because her daughter was going through or needed a kidney transplant. And she reached out to me and uh, it was really fun because she got involved with the renal team prom. Um, for those of you listening, I'm an official prom queen. I'm planning the 23rd prom. And after the 20th one, I thought, wow, I'm just gonna call myself prom queen. And Charlene got super involved and uh, just um, was really wonderful to see Jenna walk through. Uh, the different stages and now is transplanted and she was on the cover of uh, RSN's magazine so and there it is so uh, there is hope so with that I'm going to turn it over to um, Charlene. Hi everyone um, another interesting fact besides the fact that my daughter um, is a transplant survivor I actually have been living with one kidney for my almost my entire life as well so I, 18 months, I had a kidney removed and have been living with my one kidney for a very long time. So, um, so yes, it's all possible. Um, and I am very grateful for the Renal Support Network to help us all the way around. So let me introduce who I have here with me today. I have two outstanding young people in the Renal Support Network circle. Um, first is Taylor. Taylor was diagnosed um, in utero, actually, and went on dialysis at birth in 2001. He received his first transplant then in 2001 as well. Um, the kidney that he received was from his mother, and it lasted 13 years until um, 2014. He then underwent dialysis for two years, and then in 2016 received his second transplant from his dad, and it's yes. still going strong today. So yes, we yes. welcome Taylor. Hello. And um, I'm also going to introduce Hannah. Hannah was diagnosed with Hi. chronic kidney disease when she was a baby, and she received a transplant from her dad when she was eight years old. And she's currently on immunosuppressants, like um, all transplant patients are. So, and actually, let's, let's jump into transplant meds right off the bat. Let's talk okay. about, um, of first of all, when you started this journey, did you guys know how to take a pill? No, actually, I was on liquid medications, mostly um, until I was eight. Right. And then how did you learn how to take that pill? Just curious. With, with the Tic Tac. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. For me, yeah. I was so young. I just remember one day my parents were just like, okay, you're going to take meds. And I'm like, wait, what, why? And so yeah. I didn't really have like the transition from Tic Tac, but that's a really good idea though. So Yeah. Yeah, I think, I mean, my daughter didn't know how to take a pill at all. Mm -hmm. And she was 12 and a half when she was diagnosed. So okay. they were like, you have to learn how to take pills. And she's like, what are you talking about? So yeah, so we did, we started, I think with um, sprinkles, chocolate, okay. like chocolate sprinkles in jello. Yeah. So yeah. it was really a tough transition. Let me tell you that child life specialist at the hospital <gasps> had her, I love them. her, her, dial, her um, uh, what did she have? Anyway, when she was there with them, they had a real, I mean, she gave them a run for their money because she was <laughs> tough, really tough with them. But now, she, you know, yes. after transplant, she took what? 18 pills twice a day. Okay. Mm -hmm. And now she takes them, you know, she doesn't have that many. She has about six twice a day and it's right. all 
you know, so yeah, same. it's I'll very quick. Too. It's quick. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll have to say that's one um, thing I would recommend for parents because um, mm-hmm. you never know what's going to happen in life. Teach your exactly. child at a younger age how to swallow a pill. Yes. You never know when it could come in handy when there's not liquid ones around. Right. Um, so, okay. So that was the first challenge I thought of when I thought of medications. <laughs> let's talk, let's talk about um, transplant meds. Okay. So what challenges have you guys come across? For example, um, yes. Gemma was on tacrolimus, which is a very yep. popular um, drug and actually that. gave her secondary diabetes. Oh, so at right. about four weeks into her transplant, we had to come off tacrolimus and get on to cyclosporin and Zortress. Okay. Okay. And for three months, she, her system with secondary diabetes mimics type one diabetes. It was insane. Like we have a whole new respect for people with diabetes because we had to do insulin injections, et cetera. Uh So that was a big challenge. And then, um, her current meds are giving her vertigo. So Uh she can no longer do gymnastics or cheer, um, because of that. So transition to other activities that make her happy and give her that, um, right. Sense of competition where the, um, the pageants came in. So my question to you, so right. So what kind of challenges have you had and how have you been able to overcome them? Mm. So just in terms of with meds or just in general? Yeah, just, just your transplant meds and, 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 you know, did you have issues? Did you, for me, um, prednisone was a big one because that one, that's the one that makes you swell. That, that was like a big yeah. thing for me is body image. And so yeah. I would swell at higher doses with them. And so sometimes when I was being non-compliant, I'd be like, I'm not going to take it because I don't want to swell today because I don't like how I feel with it. And then Pepsi, it would, because it would slow my stomach down, it would slow like the, I guess, breakdown, breakdown of my digestion. It mm-hmm. would make me gain weight. And so I would just kind of struggle taking them because it just seems like, oh, these are going to make me gain weight or, oh, these make me feel bad. And so eventually we got me on better medication, obviously. Um, Mm -hmm. But with it, it was just, it was tough because I didn't want to take them either. Because if I was out like at school or something, because up until I want to say elementary school, I think middle school started later than elementary school did. So I would usually take them in the morning in elementary school and then at night when I was home. So in middle school, I had to take them at school. And so kids would look at me and be like, oh my gosh, you're taking meds. Like, what's wrong with you? And it was tough for that one, I will say. All right. Yeah. So just out of curiosity, are you still on a dose of prednisone? I, uh, oh yes, I am. I am on a five milligram dose. Okay. So you really I used to be, yes, very low. I used yeah. to be on like 10 milligrams constantly. Yeah. I remember when Gemma was on like 60 coming mm-hmm. out of the hospital. I mean, you're on a lot and then they taper you down, yep. um, to just a base dose. How about you, Hannah? Um, for me, I didn't really have any trouble. just like my creatinine started having trouble, like not recently, like a year ago with uh prednisone as well. I used to take like five, now I take four, but mm-hmm. now I'm like supplementing other ones into it now as well. Okay. So yeah, now right. it's, now I'm better. Right. So, I mean, you brought up a a good point too, Taylor, when you're talking about body image and other things that not taking your transplant meds is the number one reason why teens lose their transplant. That is true. So the the support (laughs) that they need to have in order to keep going, because it is a lifelong commitment. Exactly. Yeah. And knowing too, like when you get a live donor, yeah, you don't want to I, let that donor down. I have, right? I have, two, like, I have two live donors. Right, so right. my I mean, well, your first one lasted 13 years. That's it did. commendable. Yes, it, um, yeah. But it's hard because you don't, you know, if you don't take your meds, it's a direct correlation to right. you know, exactly who gave you the kidney. Like, how do you, yeah. I mean, you want to thank them in every way you can? Yeah. I did. Right. I think with some of it, though, it was also, I don't remember this. So that's another <laughs> issue that I've seen with a lot exactly. of like kids. It's, um, like even for one of my students right now, who's struggling with kidney transplant stuff, she had it when she was so young, so she doesn't understand the importance of it. And so for my first one, I didn't understand like, oh, why am I taking these meds? Oh, why are you making it so like, it's so important to you? Like, I don't understand. And I didn't understand until it was too late in my second transplant. So, well, I mean, obviously a good lesson. Yes. Big, yeah. I'm yeah. guessing you'll never miss your meds. I, I would hope so. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. Well, and speaking of missing meds, so how do you remember to take your meds? Um, um, I use an app called Round on okay. my phone, just like 
Yeah, that helps me. And also I have a timer that could go off that beeps with my monthly med cart as well but I don't turn that one on because it's annoying um but I remember and if I don't take them I see side side effects right away like I can't focus because I can't focus or also I start going insane kind of a little bit for me I use I use my phone I use an alarm just (laughs) my normal one and because I get up in the morning to go to work anyway so it's just like okay it's part of my routine and if I miss it my brain starts to go oh my gosh, did you take your meds? What are you doing? And it's just exactly. like, cause I'm out of routine at that point. And it's so ingrained into me at this point that I'll know if I miss it or not. So I'll just, I'll literally drive back from work just to go get it. Be like, I can't do my whole day like this. So. Do you hit snooze? Oh, no. I have. Yeah. <laughs> as long as you don't turn I it don't. off, right? No, I, I don't never turn it off. I don't. Good girl. That's hard to do. I watch yes. Gemma sometimes for an hour or two hitting snooze. And I'm like, just take them. I don't snooze it because it actually stays like the number seven stays until you turn it off. Oh, okay. okay. So yeah, you, you have a different mm-hmm. app that you're using. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, well, let's back up um, of course. a moment and talk about the transplant itself. Okay. Oh, okay. So <laughs> in, the time, <laughs> in the time leading up to the transplant. So your second transplant, Taylor, when yes, you ma'am. remember, uh, and Hannah, your first one, when you were My eight, only one. Mm-hmm. your only one, right. Um, well, yes. So <laughs> how would you describe the time leading up to it and around it? Like, um, okay. so my first thing was, um, uh, I want to say, I think the first thing was one eighth grade, I started to feel kind of dizzy, I guess, if that makes sense. Uh, I'm just talking about like side effects I started to see right away, which really kind of showed me like, wait, something's up. I don't understand. Are you talking about when you um, lost your first transplant? Yes, ma'am. Okay. After my, I lost my first one. Um, So I started feeling dizzy a little bit in eighth grade and then I wasn't as hungry, which was because I wasn't taking my steroids. And so I was like, oh, cool. I'm losing weight. And I'm just, I'm just like tired. I'm just tired from not eating and stuff like that. And then when it came to like, I want to say the week before we went to the doctor to see what was going on, um, I would just fall asleep anywhere. I would just, because I was so filled with toxins at that point, I would just fall asleep on the couch, wake up for 20 minutes and then look at the clock. Oh, okay. It's been like four hours. And then I would pass out again. And this went on for like a couple of weeks a couple, um, for about a week and a half, we went to the doctor and they told me that, um, mm-hmm. my first transplant had felt failed. Mm-hmm. And I'm not going to lie. The doctor was not very nice about it. Oh, um, no. that was, that was tough. I had had issues with that doctor before. And so to have her be the one that told me, Oh, your transplant failed. You're going on dialysis. And that was the exact tone that she gave me and it, it hurt. And so, um, sorry. Uh, leading up to my second transplant though actually that was one of the best weeks of my life (laughs) going up to that point um I had done a lip sync battle with my friends at school for that week and then I was also going to be hosting the Make-A-Wish uh Met Gala I was doing that the night before transplant (laughs) so oh geez uh, it was it was (laughs) crazy but it was it was totally worth it it was the best experience of my life And it just felt like everything was kind of falling into place before my second transplant up and up to that point. Yeah. (laughs) Anna, do you remember? I don't really remember anything, but my mom, thank God for my mom, because I was actually looking through, my mom made a hope book for me. There's like this website where like people could write in things. And so she documented every single day that I was in the hospital. That's kind of crazy to me. That's nice to be be able to look back and remember. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What did you do to help you kind of cope with the first couple of weeks after your transplant? I know Gemma, like she drew um, pictures for every single nurse or doctor that she saw just because it was her way of, first of all, saying thank you, but also just her expression of maybe getting out her stress um, you know, and drew Disney animals, kind of similar to that thing back there. She did that one. It's um, really good, by the way. I, yeah. I've been seeing it. I'm I'll let her know. Oh, yes. Uh, <laughs> so what, what did you do as a pediatric patient to help you deal with the stress of the transplant? Or, or maybe you um, didn't need to. So for me. Oh, here, I'll let no, you go. Okay. So okay. You're good. So, okay. Um, my mom, like, did Manny Petties. Mm-hmm. Nice. That's the only thing I remember. And, like, I also 
got like crafts and stuff and I did like little things like that. I got like a doll and all stuff. I was like looking at the photos before we even started so I could like try to explain it, but yeah. For, okay. for me, I, um, my mom was there pretty much every day uh, after transplant, my dad for her <laughs> second one. Because my dad was had donated, right. he went home after he was done because he's exhausted, obviously. <laughs> um, <laughs> so me and my mom just talked a lot. We watched Roseanne, which I don't know <laughs> why. That's always on in hospitals when we're there. It's always on. <laughs> uh, we talked. We would. We didn't eat. Usually, we would get like ice cream and Oreos or something and mash them up. But my mom was like, we were very close and like best friends back then. So having her there. Um, it was really nice just to talk yeah. with her. And then I'm a very social person. So just <laughs> talking with the do- nurses, um, talking with them every time they came into my room or when they came to do my blood draw, I'm like, okay, you're here again. Like, really? And they'd be like, they got students to come in one time. They're like, oh my gosh, are we disturbing you? I'm like, yep, totally. That's why I'm here. And then they <laughs> came and just poked me and I'm like, you're fine. <laughs> like, I'm not that mad. I'm used to this. Right. And so poking fun at it for me helps right. me yeah. uh, a lot. And how well, obviously I handled it. Family support is super important. Big time exactly. too. Um, how did your friends handle? For me, um, all I remember is that my classmates made like a sign for me because I had to leave <laughs> second grade a few weeks early because they wanted me to like quarantine like for the transplant. Um, all I remember is that they like did like get well soon cards and like I read each card. I don't have them now, but that's how. And I have friends who support me, like my best friend Sophie. She, whenever I have to have a biopsy or something, she always texts me or my mom. Why is Hannah doing this? Uh, what is going on with her? I'm worried about her. It's like so sweet. And I like that like she's on this journey with me because I also explain things to her. Right. And it's really great, you know, to yeah. like Important. tell people. Yeah. Mm-hmm. for for me I had um I had a few friends at the time we I'm very active on social media so <laughs> texting a lot um texting yeah. a few of my friends I hadn't talked to a ton of the kids at the peanut turtle which I ended up talking more to them I want to say two months after transplant and mm-hmm. they helped a lot in terms of talking online a lot we played video games together all the time I remember one of our friends from the Painted Turtle, Haley, uh, oh, yeah. me and her played video games. I want to say every day I was yeah, out of school. Yeah, you guys did, yeah. We played every day I was out of school from transplant. And so mm-hmm. a lot of my friends helped a lot. But in terms of classmates, a lot of them, for me, didn't reach out. I And my parents usually said it's because they don't understand what we're going through right. a lot of the time. Exactly. Yep. That kind of goes into... For me, at least, my transplant helps me in, I'm very active and vocal about it because one, I want that text message after I'm out of surgery, but um, <laughs> two, <laughs> uh, I want people to understand. And yeah. my transplant for me is definitely a source of confidence in everything yeah. and now more so than it was back when I was in high school, obviously. It, yeah, exactly. Same for me, like two days ago, like a friend of ours, my and Taylor is Haley. She like wrote the most inspiring post how like she stuck up for herself and all the challenges she went through and she posted it on social media. And I wrote back to her, I'm like, you're, I'm like so proud of you for speaking out about this. Cause like, I also want to be vocal and like you really inspire me and stuff like that. So I really like that, but that a really good friend of hers is also speaking out a lot. Well, and it's a part of who you are. Like if exactly. you understand who you are and everything about you, that is a, mm-hmm. a part one of yeah. my uh, experience one and of my I'm going to go back real quick um to Painted Turtle so if people don't know yes. what Painted Turtle is it is a mm-hmm. camp mm-hmm. for kids with chronic illnesses that yeah. um, is here <clears throat> in Southern California and it's it was started by Paul Newman um and his yeah. salad dressings and popcorns the lemonade and, <laughs> yes, and you can find a Painted Turtle like camp near you there are I want to say 12 of them oh, across yeah, the country 12. and there's some overseas and if you go online you can find them but there's also other organizations they happen to have a kidney week where I know these two have gone my daughter has gone and it was George Lopez sponsored. yeah and George Lopez sponsors the kidney week here in mm. the Los Angeles area um let's t- talk about the support I mean you talked oh, a little yeah. bit but paint a turtle like <gasps> What is it? Yeah, <laughs> so basically it's- how I explain it, it's a camp for a sleepaway camp for kids that typically can't go. Yeah. So they have nursing staff, they have 
um, all the dialysis setup that you could ask for pretty much. And uh, pretty much, I want to say about 24 seven, there's staff there pretty much the whole time. Mm-hmm. Uh, anything that would go wrong, there's staff there and you'll be fine. Exactly. But it's mm-hmm. Also, they have activities that they would have at a normal summer camp and it's all tailored to Huh, tailored, uh, tailored to <laughs> um, kids with this disease. So if you're in a wheelchair, you can do pretty much everything that these kids are doing. It's yeah. there's none of that medical discrimination or anything that you would potentially find at other places. Right, and completely free. Right, yeah. and, completely and free. similar to the Reno Sport Network, we don't charge mm-hmm. for any of our activities that we do mm-hmm. to support our patients. And right. one of the things I'm just going to bring it up right now while we're of talking course. about support mm-hmm. and activities, but one of the things that Lori started 23 years ago is the prom. Um, the renal teen prom, and we're geared toward kids ages 14 to 24, because typically a pediatric patient is considered pediatric until they're, if they want to be until they're 24 through college or through, um, extended learning. So, um, let's talk about your experiences with the prom. When did you first start going? I was 14. It was my first year of high school and I got dressed up in a floral tux. (laughs) <laughs> that um, kind of glistened when it hit the light. I have pictures of it somewhere, and I was on the uh, renal prom site as well with that picture. So it was, it was like my first dance because I remember the did, theme. I oh, what was it? That wasn't was that the magic one? Oh my gosh, <gasps> that's what that? I oh, I think, I think it was wish upon wish upon yeah. a dream, something okay. like that. I remember that. And then magic um, maybe was the next year. I think it was the next year, the magic one, and then Calypso yeah. was the year after. Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh. Yes. I have them on my bulletin board too. So I have all the flyers on there. Yeah. It was, it was so much fun. I invited my best friend at the time. Uh, right. So you get to bring a guest. You get to bring yeah. a guest. Yeah. They don't have to have kidney disease or anything. It can be anyone you want. Um, and we just dance. They have a big dance floor. It's usually hosted at the Hilton. Um, and yeah. they have food that's all kidney friendly. Uh, drinks that are all kidney friendly, lemonade and punch. I just want to clarify <laughs> that one. Um, <laughs> so lemonade and punch and a dance floor. They play really good playlists, like popular. So, music. so amazing. Yeah. And you just get to interact. They also mm-hmm. have a, other events um, or other little activities outside of the dance room. So maybe if like it's too much social stimulation, because I know I get that sometimes and or just uh, noise stimulation because I can get that a little bit Same. you can just go out there and it's a lot quieter and they have activities they have usually sometimes they have celebrity appearances and we do photo ops so mm. it's it's a lot of fun and you just dance for hours <laughs> yeah yeah so this past year we had to modify obviously. right it yeah. was online this COVID, so we did an online I did event, a game fun. night game it, it was so very fun, fun. so <laughs> yeah. much fun we had about 85 kids from across the country sign up yeah. to attend and um, everyone got a box home with game night supplies. And then we had a yeah. Zoom. Um, what was your favorite part, Hannah? Of- Just interacting with everybody and calling out the numbers. I had like the chance to do it. And it was so much fun. We played bingo. Yeah. And like, like all, the pe- yeah, all the people <laughs> on the, on the Zoom, we like all got our numbers and they like now do like mm-hmm. a Discord chat called the Kidney Keeps. <laughs> They're on there. You're on there, Taylor. I know. Um, so yeah, we just always check in on one another and it's really yeah. nice to like my, connect. My favorite part is like the support stuff. And also because um, I brought my partner to this one. And mm-hmm. so I got to introduce them to, why are you laughing? But I got to introduce him to my kidney world to a point, yep. so to say, yep. even though it wasn't like the physical renal prom, which will definitely go to that one as well. Um, but I got to introduce him to just what I what I go through and other kids that are going through the same thing, you know, and I liked the community aspect after, cause I know once we kind of ended some of the games, we all just kind of sat and talked for a little bit, yeah. which was really yeah. nice. It was really yeah. fun. They well, kept it open for an extra like 15 minutes. Yep. And like, we didn't want to like leave. Cause like we were like in such doing so many conversations. Like one of the girls, she was on dialysis in our, in our chat, and now she has a kidney transplant. She like just got it. And yeah. like, so great. Yeah. Yeah. It's great. So yeah, the, um, you know, obviously the idea of one friend makes a difference is continued through the the prom and the nice thing about, well, the good thing about having this online event this year is that we were able to connect with 
other teens and young people from across the country, not just here right. uh, locally right. along Los, in Los Angeles. And we're going to be doing it again this year. Um, and I think going forward, we're always going to have an online portion yeah, of it because that way we can yeah. include people from across the country. So this year we, um, for all of you out there who may have a teen or a young person from ages 14 to 24, we welcome you to sign up and attend the prom. Uh, we are partnering with, um, Ripley's Believe It or Not here in Hollywood, and we're going to be doing an online portion and an in-person portion. So those who feel comfortable being in person, we will have um, socially distant groups going through um, Ripley's and dressing up fun, um, maybe a little different for a prom, but right. kind of weird for a prom, but that's kind of fun. Um, every um, participant will get a box to enjoy fun things at home while you are participating in the prom. So we will get invitations and more information out um, by November. And so you all can see what that's about. But parents out there, please make sure that your child is connected to the prom in some way if you can, because it gives you access to other young people like these two who Thank you. can <laughs> offer you conversation and support about what they experience so that you know you're not alone, because that is really... Um, what we want to make sure happens. So um, Taylor, let's talk real quick yes. about transitioning from pediatric to adult oh nephrology. Okay. So all, <laughs> most of us love our, our pediatric nephrologists mm -hmm. because they do offer a sense of comfort and extra care. Extra how, support. Does that, how does that work? So going for from pediatric to adult, yes. So for me, I thought I was going to be on pediatric a lot longer, um, but insurance changed. And so I had right. to go straight into um, adult nephrology. Right. So I came from having numerous team members come into my room. When I would go for doctor's visits, I would go with my mom. She'd sit in the waiting room. It wouldn't be a ton of paperwork because like it's still pediatric. So I wouldn't have to do as much. Right. And I would have my social worker come in. I'd have all these people come into my room now to go into uh, adult nephrology, they'll call me like maybe a couple days before and be like, Hey, you're coming in for an appointment. And I'm like, okay, cool. Um, can I ask any questions? They'll be like, okay, you can ask when you get here. And I'm just like, all right. Um, uh, <laughs> so a little, a little blunt, but okay. Um, there's not as much for me, at least, uh, it's much more, you have to advocate for your own support. Mm -hmm. And that's a big thing that we talk about in peds, at least in my family is that teaching your kids to, advocate for themselves because when you go to adult the rumors are true they're not gonna they're not gonna hold your hand through a lot of it and that's something that I struggled with at first was that um we would go through my meds I wouldn't get like a congratulations for knowing all my meds all the time they're just like okay cool um a few nurses have been like wow you know all your meds like why do you why do you even know all that just take it and I'm just like um no I need to know what it is and so I at first I felt kind of alone with it just because I'm going in by myself now. I am, I'm an adult, obviously. Um, so I go in, I get my blood pressure taken and then the doctor comes in for maybe 10 minutes and then is like, okay, you can go like, you're fine. Um, and that that's hard. That's really hard to go from coming from peds where they're very much about your well being. not that adult isn't, but very much your whole well being, being right. Your whole well being. Yeah. I had my social worker would come in and peas and like talk to me just for a little bit. And I would tell her, even if it was just complaining about people at school for a little bit, it was still like someone was talking to me. And so listening, yeah, right. Listening to me. And that's a big thing is like, I don't feel as heard in adult nephrology anymore, unless I'm like, okay, I need to talk to you about something. And I have had to do that. I have had to do that a few times or when they, wanted to schedule some procedure that I already know has not helped me in the past. And I had to tell them, no, I'm not doing that. Like, it's very much, you have to stand your own ground and it can be scary at times, but if you, I guess can, I want to, I don't know what other words to say than like vibe with your doctor and kind of just <laughs> understand what's going on. Um, like I know my current nephrologist, he's retiring. It's a lot, a lot of older nephrologists, older people in uh, adult nephrology. Mm -hmm. And that's also another thing is I miss kind of relating to my staff a bit more where I don't feel that as much anymore in adult nephrology. I'm getting a new doctor and apparently that's common because 
the doctor will change rather frequently in adult nephrology and that can be also kind of difficult so right yeah but I've learned to stand my ground I've learned to tell them no or yes or ask more questions and then also if I need different services or I need something for my job in that I'm not gonna be able to be there for a few days or I know how something's gonna impact me I speak up and that's like a big thing that we need other transplant kids and other just kidney disease kids in general, they need to speak up more with their doctor right. and not have as much hand holding with the parents. Not that that's a bad thing. Like you want the best for your kid, obviously, right. but the best for your kid would be to have them, even if it just starts with knowing your meds, knowing the dosages and just being like, when the doctor asks for your meds, just have them say it instead. So that way they can kind of get a sense of okay, I have an ability to speak my mind a little bit here and advocate for my own health. Absolutely. Yeah. Do you find too, as um, going into an adult nephrologist, do you find sometimes you might forget to ask questions that you meant All to? All the time. <laughs> right. All so, the time. So maybe, I mean, do, I mean, it might be a good idea to, for parents as they're helping their kids transition on their phones or on their iPads, write out questions in advance as you're thinking of them. So right. that when you have your appointment in a month, you can look back and go, oh yeah, I, I remember I, we should talk about this. Right. I mean, not, you know, I don't That's know. A is there a- too. I forget yeah. questions yeah. all the time. And so I'm lucky I'm with, I'm with Kaiser right now. So I have the um, online portal so I can shoot them an email real quick. Oh, that's good. So it's, it's good. Um, And they'll get back to me in like 72 hours to where I could have Googled it really quickly, but it's okay. (laughs) Um, But yeah, it's, uh, it's very much, you want the kid to advocate or at least just have something small just to ask the doctor. Yeah. And Hannah, you had mentioned that you were starting the transition also just. Yeah, I am. And um, I'm doing really well with that. The peanut troll actually has equipped me because I went through their LIT program this summer online. And Andrew, who is one of the counselors, he's incredible. He helped like a bunch of us, like how to fly on your own with your medication, how to advocate for yourself and how to like start transitioning to the next phase like into the adult peds and everything Mm -hmm. and it's amazing like I've learned a lot um but one thing I would say stay in contact with one person from your peds team yeah because that's what I will be doing stay in contact with at least two people because I want to have the best care possible and yeah I'm learning how to stick up for myself it's just hard because I don't know what my needs are yet because everything's still the same so I have to be prepared for anything so right and you're a senior in high school correct yes correct so you still have a few years left perhaps but getting yourself started to advocate for yourself and take responsibility now is yeah I've been doing that right um do we have any questions that we can answer from uh the chat or from the q a I have a question. Um, yes. How do you approach dating? <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> oh, so like in terms of with our transplants. So for me, I, I'm very upfront about it. I'm just like, hey, uh, I have had two kidney transplants. I have a tattoo on my back <laughs> that has, um, it's a kidney and it has uh, the organ donation band wrapped around it with my transplant date. So I'll be like, you wanna see my tattoo? And they're just like, oh yeah, cool. It's probably gonna be like a butterfly or something. And I'm just like, oh no, it's my kidney. Um, here's my whole medical history. I'm very <laughs> upfront about it. I just, mm-hmm. cause I don't want, I don't wanna date somebody that doesn't understand, not that they have to understand, but in terms of like, um, that wouldn't advocate for my health, you know, like also like I advocate for myself, but knowing what I'm going through and I want other people to know what I'm going through as well. So I try to be very vocal about it in mm. terms of, uh, that dating aspect. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. How about you, Hannah? About you, Hannah? <laughs> I, I don't, I'm not dating. I'm single. So I don't have any, any experience in that. <laughs> That's okay. But if well, I, I did, think... I would tell them everything, like tell them yeah. about my medical condition up front. Right. And I do think it's com it's it's rather more common maybe than you think that young people with kidney disease, because your your body has developed differently, mm-hmm. you're not always there. Like you're not right. you're yeah. as opposed to you know I me mean, because I know you know, what you mean. Yeah, you it's the press is kind of 
a lot of other things in your body when your kidneys aren't working. Yeah. Well, so you may not come out of your shell to want to date until you're a little older. That's very common. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> not I, everyone, I, not I, everyone, Taylor. <laughs> And then there's Taylor. I, yeah. I um for me, when you're going through a transplant, especially at like, say you're going through it like teen time frame, it can be your main focus becomes on your health. So yeah. dating doesn't become a focus. And then mm-hmm. you get out of you're at like a stable position. And now you're like, oh no, I have to learn how to date and socially interact with people. Mm-hmm. That was like a big thing for me. I it took me a little bit to adjust to some of it in terms of dating. So mm-hmm. yeah okay yeah thank you for the question <laughs> Sorry, <Emma. laughs> I have I have another question yes. I think it's important um have you found that having an illness uh, lets you know who your friends are yes I mean, I'm a little bit older now but I I think that I was really sad sometimes that you know people didn't want to hang around me because I was sick but I later found out those weren't the type of people I wanted in my life anyways <laughs> No. Um, yeah, no, you touched on that a little earlier, okay. um, Taylor, about just, you know, who wanted to be there and, didn't, and, be, right. and because they don't understand. I, I understood that. Um, when I was going through my second transplant, uh, I didn't get a ton of text messages from classmates and people that I had talked to rather frequently. And at the time I was very upset uh, just because I'm like, oh, they just don't care. You know, that's how I thought. And when it came down to it later, um, it was more so that they just didn't understand what I was going through, which is another reason why I am so vocal about things. I am very blunt to say the least um, (laughs) with this kind of stuff because I'd rather people understand what I'm going through. And I'm okay with questions. If people wanna ask me questions, I'm totally okay with that. Um, In terms of who our friends are, it can be, it can be hard sometimes. Yeah. It can be very hard in terms of like you explain to them, like I have to be home at seven to take my meds if I forget them. And they'll be like, oh no, we can stay out like an hour or two later. And I'm like, no, 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 you don't understand. Like I exactly. need to be home. And you, it's hard with some of that. And then you're kind of like, okay, well, this person didn't take like my own health safety um, protected. I had, I even had um, romantic partners that would put me at risk of some things. And then it came down to it. Like they didn't, after knowing my medical history, they didn't put me first. And so I kind of, I cut it out. I cut it out of my life. I was not going to deal with that because that's not fair to me. And it's like, you don't want that kind of stuff in your life with that. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I found with my daughter's friends too, I was surprised on who responded and who didn't afterwards yeah. she was in eighth grade when she had her transplant and I was like wow I really we didn't hear from you <laughs> I mean, I, some of it's being scared you know I mean they're yeah. scared about not wanting yeah. to say something right or wrong you just have to kind of take it all in real and realize that it's not always personal they really I get it it's how I, they are dealing with it not how it you still were feels personal on our end I know, I know. exactly I know. and that's I, I always tell people, even if I, I'm not going in for a surgery, please just ask me questions. Like, I'd rather you understand than not text me. You know, I, it sounds like I just, I would rather be able to explain what I'm going through because it makes, one, it makes me feel better about it. Cause like, if I'm going in for a biopsy, I'm already nervous. And so, yeah, same here. Like, so <laughs> someone asking like, Hey, how are you feeling? Or, Hey, what's going on? And me talking about it makes me feel like I feel heard and I also can work through the right. process over text as well. Oh, right. yes. <laughs> Miss no. Lori asked a question. Uh, do you have any hobbies or ways to deal with when you feel down? Hannah, I'll let you take this one for now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, I used to paint art. I used to do art a lot. Like this past year with quarantine, I did art. I haven't done it lately, but yeah, that would help me. Also, just listening to music, any type of music. I was always a musical person. Mm-hmm. When I was in the hospital, I listened to Taylor Swift a lot. And I love it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you know me. Anyway, but yeah, her lyrics always resonated with me. And she she's like my type of person that I listen to. Yeah. And yeah, it's also a great conversation starter with people. They're like, why do you like this person that you listen to so much? And then like, I always give the backstory. So yeah. yeah. 
for me, it's uh, video games. I like the <laughs> online communication factor just right. because it connects me with other people as well. And being a social butterfly, I mean, to my, <laughs> <laughs> sometimes that's a lot. Um, but having the socialization of video games helps me deal with things. And sometimes just hanging out by myself is fine. I also read a lot. I know you can kind of see over here, that's my bookshelf <laughs> filled with <laughs> books I've read. Um, and that helps me a lot if I am feeling down, but I also don't want to like go out and socialize. I'll sit and I'll just read a book, usually a, a romantic comedy. I know <laughs> basic, but uh, those help me not feel as down and not as by myself because I can read about these characters in a book. So yeah, great. All right, COVID Ooh. and being safe. Mask always. <laughs> Mask always. <laughs> um no matter what um also for me like when things first started I have like a small group of friends that I would only see them and nobody else okay because I was like trusted with them but now that I'm vaccinated I don't worry as much it's just I feel fine have you guys gotten the uh the third boost for I have not yet no No. I I know my nephrologist recommended it though yeah I don't plan on it for right now yeah Gemma got her third one and okay. didn't have any reaction whatsoever. No side effects um, or nothing? Pardon me? No, no, no side Zero. effects from it? Zero. Okay. Zero. Not yes. even a sore arm. Okay. The second one hit me really hard. And I, yeah. Same. Okay, I say it hit me hard. It hit me hard for a day, <laughs> but I told my work it took me a week to recover because I wanted to go to knots. I'm sorry. Um, but <laughs> I hope you're not listening. No, 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 no. Um, <laughs> if you're from Ladera Elementary, this was before I left the preschool. Um, I totally did not do that. I was so down. Ow. Um, <laughs> um, so yeah. dreams for the future. So that's a good one. I just, I just got my dream job of being a middle school teacher. Um, mm-hmm. I've had that since I was, I actually got that dream Um, I had used to want to be like a movie star kind of thing. And I had done theater for years. Um, It just became a very competitive field that I was not being as nice, trying to be a nice person. I'm not cutthroat competitive kind of thing. Um, In terms of my dream job, though, I want to be a middle school, maybe not special needs teacher later on. But right now I want to be a middle school, high school math teacher. And I'm finishing up credential stuff and everything and a few more tests that I just have to get done to be fully in my job. So that's what I'm trying to do right now. Mm. How about you, Hannah? For me, I want to be an ultrasound technician because I'm so in tune with the body. Like when they look at my kidneys and everything, they're like, oh, we can't tell you, but I already know what's going on anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I want to become an ultrasound technician so I can like look at what other people are going through. I also might want to do nephrology. I don't know, but I'm going to probably go to a community college for two years and then transfer to somewhere else. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I've noticed with a lot of transplant patients, I'm sorry. I also know we have other questions, but um, with other (laughs) transplant and nephrology kids, a lot of them want to go into nephrology to help uh, others who are going through the same thing. In my, in my case, I did not want to because I was deterred from it. So it can go (laughs) either way. But um, exactly. yeah, I know a lot of them want to do that too. All right. Uh, well, we're looking at um, some time constraints now because yes. we need to move on to the, next, to the next session. <laughs> However, um, yes. just a last parting thought. Mm-hmm. What um, suggestion would you give to a young person who is battling kidney disease? And oh, talk to people. I mean, even if you're shy, just, just talk to people, talk to your doctors, tell your friends <laughs> what's going on. It might seem daunting at first, but honestly- exactly it'll tell you who your friends are and then just kind of letting people know what's going on with you. It'll make you feel better about it too. And then you also have, you have all of us, you have the renal support (laughs) network. We're here. Um, We're here to talk to you at any point. Um, Yeah. Just talk to people. (laughs) For For me, it would be be an advocate for yourself and also remember that your journey is different than anybody else's but you're still in the same boat because you have kidney disease we have all one have have one thing in common exactly also and and know it gets better like it always gets better like it it, always does you might be you might be like hurting a lot right now because you just got the diagnosis or something but it you'll feel better I promise (laughs) yeah yeah very good well i would like to thank my two amazing young people thank here you. taylor and <laughs> so much for your insights and for sharing thank you. 
We really thank appreciate you. it. And we know that it's helped parents and other uh, young people out there. So thank you. Thank, thank you, you for so the much. opportunity. And, and you, you guys are awesome. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. You, guys, um, you know, you always make the prom so special and you make other oh, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Ms. So I'm, I'm banking on you guys to take over RSN one day. So oh, of course. <laughs> ah, there you go. <laughs> I'm ready. Yes. Yeah, and keep an eye out, everyone, for the prom information. Yes. Coming up. Yes. All right. Yes. Okay. Uh, how do I move? Okay. Thank you. Awesome. Oh, bye. Bye. Thank you. And a shout out to our corporate mission partners for making this happen.